Hello, I'm back and now we're doing Biology 1.3. So I still don't have any credentials and I'm just following what my teacher has told me and the official IB books. Chapter 1.3 is all about membrane structure. So we'll begin with explaining how to draw the membrane structure that is currently accepted, which is the Singer-Nicholson model, which is also called the fluid mosaic model. So here I have drawn a membrane that is surrounded by water and we will go through each of the components within this membrane. So first things first, there are these phospholipids, which are these circles with lines um, and they are bilayered, meaning that there are two of them to create two layers. Then there are the integral proteins, which are found together with the heads and the tails of the phospholipids. Then there are peripheral proteins, which are only found among the heads of the phospholipids. There is a glycoprotein that has a carbohydrate tail, and there is also cholesterol. Let's take a closer look at the phospholipids model. So basically, we have the circle, which is the hydrophilic head. That means it's attracted to water. Meanwhile, it has a hydrophobic tail, mean, meaning that it repels water. So this tail will always be on the inside of the membrane. Meanwhile, the head will be on the outside. Phospholipids are antipatic, meaning that they both have hydrophilic and hydrophobic properties. Phospholipids are also what gives the membrane fluidity. Now let's talk about cholesterol. So cholesterol will look something like this, and it has the hydrophobic part, which is uh, the hexagons and the pentagon, and then it has an OH that is hydrophilic. Now when you draw it on a test, and when I drew it in my membrane, it just sort of looked like a squiggly line in between the phospholipids, and that is okay. You can draw it like that. So what this does, it reduces membrane fluidity, it reduces the permeability to some solutes, um, specifically hydrophilic ones. It is only found in animal cells and it leads to the membrane being stable over a wider range of temperatures. So second last thing for this chapter is glycoproteins. This, I'm so sorry, this is like the ugliest drawing ever. So essentially you have this glycoprotein that has a carbohydrate tail that can be used by immune cells for recognition. So this immune cell can say, oh, this cell belongs to my body and it's not a virus or an enemy or you know anything like that. And they're also used as hormone receptors. So now we are gonna discuss the history of how we thought the membrane looked like before. So there was the Davison Danielli bottle, which is from 1935, or it was created in 1935. Essentially, this model sort of looks like a sandwich, so we refer to it as like the sandwich model because the proteins were on the outsides of the phospholipids and they were like two layers. You know, it's the bread, so that's sort of where that came from. But there was evidence proving this wrong and proving the Singer-Nicholson model right, which was from 1972. I don't know if I mentioned that before or not. So the first thing was that cells were tagged with different markers, which were the proteins were tagged. So if you can see in this model, there was a protein with green and a protein with red. And when you mix them, it became red and green, not just red and green separately, but they mixed, meaning that there is fluidity within a membrane. The second piece of evidence was found using a technique called freeze etching and uh, separating the membrane. So essentially they freezed it and they separated the membrane and it showed that the proteins were within the membrane, not on the outside. So the very last piece of information you need to know for this chapter is six of the different functions of membrane proteins. So the first function is using channel proteins for facilitated diffusion. You don't need any energy to do this, any ATP, which we will discuss in the next chapter. So the second function is using protein pumps for active transport. And when you do active transport, you do need to add energy. The third function is the hormone function. 
So essentially you have this hormone in the blood vessel and you put it into a protein in the membrane and it leads to actions within your cell. The fourth function is the enzyme function. So essentially you can use the protein to create reactions such as breaking, whatever that is. The fifth function is called tight junctions. Essentially, you have this membrane protein that keeps the cells close together. The last function that is discussed in this chapter is the electron carrier. Essentially, an electron can be moved from protein to protein until it gets to where it needs to go. So that was it for chapter 1.3. Hopefully I will come back soon with more because clearly the biology videos have very, very, very large distances between them. Um, but I will try my best to speed run a little bit because now we're soon at the end. So please like, subscribe, and comment. You can follow me at Johanna Frenner if you want. Goodbye!